welcome uh, to one of the, the world's premier institutions. And one of the things that no doubt you've heard this past week that makes Stanford so great is the purposeful engagement uh, opportunities and experiences that Stanford makes available to students. And one of the really interesting ways that Stanford does this is through uh, project-based courses, much like ETC that you just heard about, um, but also through Hacking for Defense. Um, so there are 10 experiential-based, uh, project-based courses on campus, and two of them, ETC and Hacking for Defense, uh, relate specifically to energy. Um, Hacking for Defense looks at a wide swath of national security issues, but there's a specific subset that we dial into um, that, that looks at securing and protecting um, the U.S. energy network. <clears throat> Now, I just want to begin to, to tell you a little bit about Hacking for Defense uh, by giving, telling you a story about a, a previous project. Um, SEAL Team One sponsored a project, and they came to Stanford and Stanford Hacking for Defense and said, hey, we've got this pretty big problem. Our divers spend too much time underwater and have adverse health consequences because of it. So what we'd like you Stanford Hacking for Defense team is to create a wearable or a Fitbit so that we can monitor uh, vital signs like blood pressure, core temperature, and, um, and, and depth. And so the student team said, yeah, sure, no problem, we can do that. But what the student team didn't know when they accepted this problem was that in order for the, you to be successful in the Hacking for Defense classroom, a requirement is for you to get off campus and start talking to real people and understand what the problem really is. And that's exactly what the team did. Um, in this case, the team went out and spoke with commercial divers, military divers, as well as people involved in the commercial um, diving industry. And what they learned the first week was pretty frustrating for them. They have learned that military divers will not wear a Fitbit or a wearable. And you know, the, the team was really interested in this and said, why? Why wouldn't you do this wearable? The, the SEAL team told us that we, uh, our, our problem sponsor said that we needed to build this. And they said, let me tell you something. I've worked my butt off to be a SEAL diver. And someone seeing that my blood pressure is a little higher, my core temperature is a little low, isn't going to be taking me off the mission. I'm dedicated to the mission. So hat in hand, the team went back to their problem sponsors and said, hey, look, you wanted us to build a wearable. We can build a wearable, but we've just found out that the divers won't wear it. But we have spoken with some other people in industry, and we've realized that the real problem is that they're spending too much time underwater, and they're spending too much time underwater because they can't see where the heck they're going. Where it makes a lot of sense uh, from going from point A to point B on land, it's pretty easy. When you're underwater and you can't really see very well, and you can't get a GPS lock unless you spend about five to 10 minutes going to the surface to poke your antenna out of the water, get that GPS lock, spend five more minutes resubmerging, and then moving on to the mission. Well, we think that if we hack and, and solve the navigation problem, we can solve the problem you have with mitigating health, health consequences. So the, the, the SEAL Team 1 gave them a big thumbs up and said, OK, let, let's, let's see how this pans out. And what ended up happening was the team built a GPS beacon or buoy whereby the SEALs at depth could just release it. The buoy would give them a GPS lock. They could bring it back down and then move on with the mission. And it would save them approximately 20 minutes of underwater time, which is substantial. They built this, this um, prototype in the project, product realization lab here at Stanford. And they tested it at the, the Stanford swimming pool. And the SEALs loved it. Um, and they, they began to implement it. So this is just one example of from the, the Hacking for Defense um, projects that, that had this, this meaningful and interesting impact. Now I want to do a 180 here. So I told you a little bit about what Hacking for Defense is. Now I just want to bust some myths because with the, the, the name Hacking for Defense, a lot of baggage comes with that. So just, oh, just to be clear, you're not going to be issued a pretty sweet custom ski mask in this course. Uh, 
You won't learn how to hack into your computer uh, or someone else's files. Um, but what you will do, the hacking you will do, much like the example I just gave, is be able to hack through all of the noise um, that's involved with a problem. Hack through what the government thinks are the solution. And 90% of the time when it thinks the solution is what it needs to solve a problem, it's 90% of the time it's wrong. So hacking through that. Uh, another misconception is when I talk about hacking for defense, usually with, with guys, their eyes get really big, like I get to build weapon systems. First of all, if you can, if you can build a weapon system in 10 weeks, um, Tony Stark doesn't have anything on you. Um, but we, we, don't, we don't do anything offensively related. We don't build weapon systems. We do nothing. None of our project involves, projects involve offensive capabilities. Um, instead, what we focus on very acutely are solving the problems that men and women in uniform face, making their lives better by protecting them or potentially by, um, um, excuse me, by, uh, by helping them, them do their jobs. This thing's moving faster than I can speak. Uh, third thing is a lot of people, especially now uh, on campus, think, well, um, let's go back here. All right. Um, they think, well, I, don't, I can't take hacking for defense. I don't agree with this administration or that administration. I'm not, I don't want to work for the Democrats or I don't want to work for the Republicans. But the fact of the matter is, our problems, again, focus on the men and women in uniform, and those don't change from one administration to the next. The data display problems that someone had during the Obama administration are the exact same problems that, the, the, that they have under the, the Trump administration. And so we're politically agnostic, and we're just really hyper-focused on objectively solving um, problems using the lean startup methodology. methodology. <clears throat> so you've gotten a little bit to know an example of what the class is, and now what the, the class wasn't, we busted some myths. The core goal here, and probably some, a reoccurring theme that you've heard through the week, is we're really focused on giving students an experience and giving them the opportunity to make a profound impact off campus. And we do this through the, the, uh, the national security space. And there are three core things that we teach our students. How to solve the right problem, and then how to innovate at speed, and then how to deploy or deliver that, that solution, um, and all using lean methodology. We do it in 10 weeks, the quarter system, so we throw a really gnarly problem at you and say, go, and you've got 10 weeks to solve it. And many students report that it's like a startup type atmosphere, um, which it certainly is. We, we really dial up the heat and you having interaction with real um, men and women in uniform um, help, helps to bring that to the fore. But you're not left alone. You know, the Stanford, the Hacking for Defense ecosystem is substantial. First of all, you've got four members of the teaching team, one of which is Steve Blank, um, who many of you have probably heard of. Uh, he's the, known as the father of modern entrepreneurship. Um, we have a technologist well-versed in the space, uh, someone that, used, that ran um, DOD innovation in the Pentagon for 30 years, and myself, I've got um, a special operations background and uh, did some policy work in DC as well. Student teams, one of the great things that you hear about Hacking for Defense in these, these uh, classes on campus is its multidisciplinary scope. And the best teams that we have are, are definitely multidisciplinary. So each course, it just runs in spring, um, and we have between six and eight teams of four people. Uh, those four people, as I said, the best teams are multidisciplinary, usually have some component of a business school student. Um, another of an, an engineering student, and maybe a policy or law student, uh, as well as a CS student. And the reason is, is because, and, and the, reason, the reason for having a multidisciplinary team and why that's so important is because engineers are really good at building things and they'll just get out and build something. With the case that I gave you initially, they may have built the best wearable uh, on, on the planet, but it wouldn't have solved the problem. 
Uh, by contrast, policy and business students are really good at discovering the needs and getting to the root of problems, but they may not have the technical expertise to actually build something. And so we're looking for that sweet spot dream team um, with, with our teams. Each team works on one problem. Uh, everyone, and no, problem, no team works on the same problem. So we have six to eight problems uh, per, per course. And these problems come from all over the Department of Defense. They, our problems have ranged from all four services, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marine Corps. We've got some interagency problem sponsors, as well as we had the CIA and an NSA problem as well. So lots of gnarly, sexy problems uh, enter, enter our class, if, if you could say defense is sexy. Um, but real um, learning experiences. Teams also get two mentors, one from the commercial space and one from the defense space. And we, we hand select our mentors so that they are well-versed in, in lean startups. So this is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And they help our teams walk through the lean methodology and apply that to solving a mission-critical uh, task. They also open up their Rolodex and can help point people uh, and introduce um, team members to, to people that could help them actually solve the problem, maybe leverage technology in a very interesting way. Our military mentors come from the Hoover Institution, they're senior military fellows, and they help in two ways. They help translate Pentagon speak to civilian speak and back again so that students understand what they're, what they're what people are telling them, and also understand how to communicate uh, to the, the community as effectively as possible. They too open up their Rolodex and say, hey, have you talked to Bob or Sally? Um, they would be perfect people for you to speak to to understand this problem a little bit better. So you take this entire ecosystem and you combine it into one, and student teams are responsible for doing 10 to 15 interviews a week. So 100 to 150 interviews in a quarter to really understand what the problem is and what solution would align with that problem. The way the, the class is structured, it's a three hour class once a week and students get to present between, uh, for between eight to 12 minutes and they present in four things. One is what their hypotheses were um, about the solution and the problem space going into the week. Two, how they tested those hypotheses by who, who they spoke with or um, who they spoke with and how they tested. Three, what they've learned. And four, what they're doing moving forward. And Steve, Steve, Pete, and I help to provide guidance uh, to, to help these students um, problem solve and get to the, the core of a solution. So it's been a long week. If you take nothing away from, from what I've just said, just remember three things, please. Hacking for Defense puts real life national security challenges in your lap and allows you and connects you with people experiencing them in government so that you can solve something very meaningfully. In doing so, you'll learn, you'll have skills and experiences that will translate not just to careers in defense, but also the industry side as well. Um, which will in turn help to make strong real world impacts. Um, just over the summer, one of my uh, former student from the spring quarter got in contact with me and said, hey, Jeff, H4D helped me land a job at Google. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. How, how did that happen? And they said, well, I nailed the interview. Uh, sorry, first of all, I got the interview based off of a connection that I made during one of the interviews in the commercial sector. And second of all, I nailed the interview because they asked me the age-old question uh, that interviews commonly asked of, describe to me a time where you've dealt with uh, uh, team challenges. And they had a ready-made example with, with hacking for defense. And the other question of, describe to me a time where you've used what you learned in the classroom in the real world. And they, they were able to, to talk about this as well. So lots of skills you can cultivate here from network building to also being able to cut through bureaucracy and deploy a solution, be it on the commercial side or the defense side. Spring class, lots of things happen before the class. 
Uh, the problems go live and at the beginning of January, so you can select which problems you think you might be interested in, and then you apply for you apply to the class to work on those problems. Lots of things to remember up here, but just go to our website, hackingfordefense.stanford.edu for the number four, and sign up, put your name down um, and your email address, and we, will, we won't spam you. Um, we'll, we'll send you notifications for when problem statements have gone live, um, when the applications might be due, when we're holding an information session, and how you might be able to get in touch with other students interested in the course. Um, I think I'm out of time now, um, but as Uncle Sam says, we want you for Hacking for Defense, um, and please reach out via the, the website um, or email me directly, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Oh, yeah. Do you have to be an American citizen? Oh, great question. No. So you don't need to be an American citizen. It's open to all Stanford students. You, there is no um, security clearance required. They're all open source problems, and there's no IP associated with them. So we try to keep it all open source until you graduate from the course, and we, we actually have some, some funding that we can provide um, to help you move beyond and, and create IP around the solution that you've, that you've generated. Any other questions? How many of the projects that you uh, create do you see actually being deployed in the <clears throat> actual uh, products that are sold or used by? Yeah, that's a that's another good question. See, it varies. All problems aren't created equally, and to be quite honest, as you could no doubt tell from the example I gave you, the the way they thought the the problem would have developed is actually quite different than how it actually did. Um, so there's always a core that is valuable to the defense space. And usually it's around, it's around um, really bringing some maturity and some understanding to a problem. Um, but I would say related, specifically related to your point, about a quarter of our teams continue on, um, either producing that, that, um, that product in the commercial space to sell to the government or continue working on it uh, in their spare time. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all at spring 2019.